he has bad blood or she's just an evil person. As an aside, I find it fascinating that this simplistic social fallback to explain a person's behavior is in full accord with the primitive superstitious duality postulated by nearly all established religions, good and evil. The gene in this case has been replaced, has replaced the satanic demon that once possessed a person, and thus the person has no control over their evil, evil actions. In other words, they are slaves to their genes. Well, as research has progressed, it has been found that genes do nothing of the sort. Genes are stretches of DNA that produce proteins, which of course are vital to the operation of the brain, the nervous system, and the whole body. However, they are not autonomous initiators of commands. They do not cause behaviors in any real sense of the idea. In the words of professor of biology and neurology at Stanford University, and a well-known anthropologist as well, Dr. Robert Sapolsky, genes are rarely about inevitability, especially when it comes to humans, the brain and behavior. They're about vulnerability, propensities, and tendencies. As it turns out, the determining factor of genetic propensities, particularly in the realm of behavior, is the environment that the organism resides in. For example, recent research has shown that a gene could exist for depression. However, just because you have that gene does not mean you're going to get depressed. It takes some form of dramatic environmental stressor to trigger the genetic response, such as a sudden death of a loved one or something very severe. In other words, the environment triggers the existing genetic propensity. Even with a genetic predisposition to a particular illness, there's no guarantee you're going to get it. A chair with a broken leg is not dangerous if you never sit on it. As a variation of this, it is interesting to know how the environment even affects broad physiological attributes, a realm traditionally left for the genetic side of the nature and nurture debate. A study was done a few years ago at the Miami School of Medicine with premature infants in neonatology wards where they decided to simply touch a section of the infants in the wards a few times a day while the other section was not touched. All feeding patterns were made alike, everything else equal. As it turned out, the infants that were touched grew 50% faster and were noticeably more healthy. They were released from the hospital a week early. When compared months later, these same kids showed better health and agility than those that were not touched. It's incredible. This is a dramatic finding on many levels, for it shows that the genetically prescribed growth hormone release can be profoundly influenced by a simple and subtle environmental experience. Furthermore, the environment can not only trigger genetic propensities or influence their extent, it can override them to a certain degree. A couple of years ago, another study was done at Princeton University where scientists were able to genetically engineer mice removing a key gene relevant to their neurotransmitter system, selectively targeting learning and memory. As a result, the cultivated mice were poor at various memory and learning exercises. They had trouble recognizing simple objects, their accuracy of smell was poor, and they were unable to learn well in many ways, which otherwise would be normal to an average mouse. Once their disability was confirmed and established, the scientists then put the cognitively dim mice as adults in an enriched, stimulating environment. And over time, it was found that many of the genetically engineered learning disabilities were actually overcome by the simple exposure to an intellectually nurturing environment. In other words, the environment is actually able to reestablish neurological pathways that seemed not to exist. Again, this is a powerful testament of the power of the environment when it comes to brain and hence behavior. We're perpetually molded and shaped by what's around us, and it has an extremely direct effect on our genes, our genes and what might be inherent to us. It's very important. The reason this is being brought up is to illustrate the fact that our environment is provably the most important determinant in our functionality. Nurture, in many ways, dictates nature on many levels, ranging from behavior to psychology, excuse me, to physiology, psychology would have relevance, but to physiology, and health. Consequently, it is incorrect to think that the human being is a slave to his biology, especially when it comes to his or her actions. This is a powerful myth which needs to be dispelled and debunked. For when we realize the importance of our environment, we'll be much more prone to changing it, and that's why I'm talking about this. 
In isolation, it might seem like these are abstractions, but we have to learn that biologically, we are only as, as relevant, so to speak, as the environment which interacts with our biology. However, as one final example worth considering, which from my perspective summarizes the over overwhelming power and relevance of our environmental culture we are exposed to, let's consider the implications of feral children. A feral child is a human child which has lived isolated from human contact from a very young age, isolated from society or human society. Historical examples of this range from children that have been locked in rooms by their parents for years to children who have been abandoned in the wild and raised, so to speak, by animals. This is Jeannie. She was discovered in 1970, having been locked in a single room virtually alone for 10 years. When they found her at 13 years old, she could barely understand language, and she knew only a few words. She was 54 inches tall. Her eyes could not focus beyond 12 feet, and she walked in an awkward, hunched manner, and she could not chew solid food. Once rescued, psychologists and scientists immediately began working to rehabilitate Jeannie, creating a nurturing environment. And she quickly began to overcome a great amount of the problems that she had had, but due to the severe scars that she went through, something very specific stuck out, which has a specific relevance to the point I'm trying to make, and that was her inability to learn language. While humans obviously have a genetic predisposition for language, in, it is cases like this that show how the environment does not, in, if the environment does not engage those propensities at a certain point in time, then those, those language capabilities will not form. It requires the environment to stimulate the effect. And that's, that's a very important thing, and I'm going to keep reiterating that. This young girl was rescued in May of this year in Russia. She was locked in a room with dogs and cats for several years, causing her to behave like an animal. She could not speak. She lapped up her food and drink with her tongue, and she walked on all fours. She was five years old when they found her, but her physical size was only two of a two-year-old. Excuse me. This is fascinating, apart from being horrific. It's the fact that feral children, they can pick up and imitate things in their environment that to us would seem absolutely unhuman. This is a girl named Noxana Malaya. Uh, she was also extremely neglected and ended up spending the majority of her childhood between the ages of three and eight, five years, living with dogs in the back of the family home. She actually slept in the kennel with the dogs for five years, and when rescued, she had adopted incredible canine mannerisms including barking, a higher than average sense of smell and hearing. She ate raw meat. She walked on all fours and knew virtually no language. It is sociolo sociological examples like this that should really make one step back and question the lowest common denominator of uh, what is supposed to be human nature. Please understand that there's no denial that we human beings are wired in a particular way. However, the fact is we obviously, especially at a young age, have an incredible ability to adapt to our environment. We are exceptionally malleable. And as studies have shown, we'll adapt based on what is supported and reinforced by the social condition we inhabit. If the known propensities of human beings, such as walking upright, learning language, and the like, are not triggered and supported by the environment, then they might not manifest. Therefore, again, the human being is very much a cultivated organism. The quality of a person's health and behaviors really comes down to the quality of the environment, culture, and hence social influences they are exposed to. This is critical that society fully understand this and adjust accordingly. It should be no wonder the world we live in when we examine the system, the environment that creates us. And this is the point. We, as so-called individuals, are running composites of our life experiences. We are walking expressions and cultivations of the environments we have passed through up until this very moment. And when it comes to survival, only those behavioral attributes that have served a function in your environment are reinforced and made dominant. Once you understand this, the corrupt world around you suddenly makes perfect sense. Human beings are not inherently greedy or inherently competitive or inherently corrupt. 
It is the social system, it's the environment that creates us. Just as a young girl would choose to walk on all fours 